Okay, so like I said, my name is Paul Bolton, <coughs> excuse me, uh, and we're going to do an introduction to basics of logics and game design. Okay, I'm just going to share my screen. Okay, can everybody see that screen? It's sharing. Yes. Yeah, thanks. Brilliant. Okay, thanks a lot. Okay, so I sent you a link yesterday in the email, so somebody, everybody should have got a, a link to the email last night, and it should have given you the opportunity to open up this web page that I've created to go that follows along with this course today. Um, did everybody manage to get that link and open up the web page? It would have been in your email account. Is that a yeah? You have to say yeah because. Put it in the chat as well, Paul. Yes. You're in the chat. Yeah, brilliant. Okay, thanks a lot. I can. So yeah. basically, um, if you click there, if you go to the website, as I could say, and go back to it, okay, it should open up like this. If you go to the website homepage, it'll open up the first page like that, and you need to click this section here, which is one of the posts that I put on. Once you're inside the post, Okay, if you scroll down, I have put on a few links that we're going to be using today for the course. Okay, and also put on my game that I have built to go, excuse me, to go with the, the course that we're going to be doing today. Um, you can have a play with that later, but uh, just hold fire on playing with it because obviously it, is, it can be quite noisy. It's got sound effects in it as well. And we don't want that uh, spoiling the presentation. Okay, but I will give you opportunity to play it later on. Okay. Okay, so my name is Paul Bolton. I'm a apprenticeship skills coach for Back to Work Group. I'm a 12 years qualified teacher and a 12 years member of the IFL Institute for Learning. I'm also a qualified level two first aider for mental health as well. Um, I've been teaching, uh, I did my degree at Huddersfield University many years ago. And one of the things that I, I got really got in, involved with was game design and multimedia when I was doing my university degree. And I've carried that on when I'm into my teaching career and most of the, the actual classes that I teach are related to either programming, uh, game design, website design, uh, even databases as well. So quite, quite a knowledge of all the, the things that you need to actually build up for an actual game. Okay. <clears throat> so let logic in games masterclass. So first thing we're going to look at what is called the essential meaning of logic. OK, so um, logic is a proper, reasonable way of thinking about or understanding something. So when you're obviously in a daily basis, you, you use logic as a human being. OK, when you get up in the morning, you make a cup of tea. You might not realize it, but you are actually losing, using a bit of logic because you get the cup out of the cupboard. You put the cup down next to the kettle, you put sugar in it and you put a tea bag or coffee, whichever one you, you want. You add water to it and then you keep adding water to it if there's not enough water in and then you add milk to it if you want milk and you keep adding milk into it till it's uh, the right amount of milk is in there so if you can understand that that is basically how our, our logic in our brain works okay and like i say too it says a particular way of thinking about something so it's a it follows processes so a logical process usually starts and has a finish at the end as well and the science that sort of the formal process used in thinking and reasoning. So we as human beings, we use the thinking and reasoning quite a lot when we're using logical uh, meanings of logic in, in our daily lives. What we want to do is we want to try and transfer that kind of logic into what we use for things like game design or anything else to do with programming as well. It couldn't, can't just be game design. It can be your, your thermostat on your, your heater how that actually works in your house, obviously quite important at the moment with all the, 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 the thing of all the bills going up. So understanding how the logic of the thermostat heater interacts with the actual uh, heater itself is quite important as well, okay? So logic maps for games. So what we do is we have to check the logic, okay? Because if you have a game and it doesn't follow some kind of logic, then obviously one, the user will get confused to the actual game will not work correctly and and it's just one of those things where you need to make sure that the logic follows we will be going over through it a bit more in detail later on there is a thing called uh, prevent feature creep and it, like i said feature creep is about a thing or event someone's saying so one of the things is as a developer you develop a game 
and then you release that game and you put it into the marketplace, one of the things you usually get then is you get, wouldn't it be cool uh, if the player or game had this or this in it? So what that is basically is uh, it's feature creep. So when you create a game, people are then asking you for more features into it. It might not follow the logic that you decided for that game, so that's something that you need to consider. Okay, and that can also happen when you do it, you're working in the team as well. So when you're designing a game and working in the team, you can actually have somebody bringing other ideas in and you might think, well, actually, I've set this logic out this way. It might not work the way they want it to do. Uh, one of the things you should really always do is visualize a game before you even write any code as well. Uh, and game design, it starts from the planning phase. It's, it's you not sit down in front of a computer. You don't open up your computer and start writing code. That's way down the line. What you do, you start looking at it visually and in a logical way of a human being first. And you have things like pseudo code that you can actually write and you can do screen designs. And we're going to go through a bit more through that in a bit. OK, uh, it, game design development starts on the planning phase. Uh, it is a critical component for get of games design. And we create a thing called a GDD. So it's called a game design document to see the game as a whole. OK, is everyone following on with that at the moment? Yes, brilliant. Okay, so one of the things you need to think about when you, uh, you start doing what's called a game design document is things like meet the team. Um, so like I say, before you begin, I'll show you game design to template others. You have to familiar yourself with the team, think of who's gonna be taking which tasks on, uh, who's gonna be developing which section of it. This seems obvious, but meeting and collaborating with others is really, really important when you're designing games, okay? Uh, and again, there is a logic in the team's construction. Do you know what I mean? So you, you obviously think of how, how, what, how the team is put together logically so you get the best out of the team as well. So it's not just a matter of just saying, uh, Paul, you're going to do this, or Dean, you're going to do that. You have to look at the skills that the person has and then logically put them in the right place at the right time. Uh, basically, it means that, <coughs> excuse me, that you're all on the same page when it comes to little details. The last thing you need to, to work with strangers, breaking down communication, and making the game a lot harder to work out. If you have a good team and you think about that team and you get the best out of that team, then you will get the best game, okay? If you put someone in a team that doesn't feel comfortable in the position they're in, a bit like football, if you if someone had put Ronaldo in the goal, he wouldn't be very good in the goal, would he? But he's very good as a striker at the top, okay? So you need to think about that as well. Then when we start to think about the game, um, we're thinking about the title page. So the first page you see when you go into a game. So let's just say it could be uh, Call of Duty where you go in and you've got the actual uh, front part of the game with an explanation of what the game is going to be doing, okay, and how you're going to play the game. Um, and that's the kind of things you need to start thinking about. It's like the title page. And it says on this example, it says, we're all familiar with filling out job applications, sometimes cover letters. You need to convince a potential employer that you're the best for the job. Same applies with games. So if you want to sell your game and make sure it's, it, 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 it's a game that people want to play, then you have to have a really good title page, concept idea. Um, so, and think about that. It, it's not just, oh, well, I'm just gonna create the new Call of Duty. If you decide you want to make a game that's similar to the Call of Duty, then you have to look how, how, how it works, how it's worked well for, Call of Duty franchise, um, and then you can like, adopt that into your game design documentation. There's a thing called uh, a concept statement. Uh, what is the concept of your game? Is it going to be like a puzzle game uh, uh, where the person has to early must find a way home? Uh, it could be a game which is the main character needs to find crucial information in an abandoned hospital. Uh, it could be uh, like a map game that is. Uh, you need to outline the idea, the main idea of the game will be. And this is basically what you're starting off. You're starting discussion to how the game is going to look and how it's going to behave. Okay, so let me look at the genre. So what genre do you want for the game? Okay, there's loads of genres out there. You've got RPGs, uh, first-person shooters. Uh, you've got loads of different genres that you could uh, go for. Which is your, what is your game? going to be which genre is it going to fit in okay and one of the things that you might want to consider as well is is the genre already oversaturated is there too many games in this genre already because obviously that relates to your marketing and then obviously in sales eventually 
So, but unless you can bring something new to the genre, which is going to stand out from all the other ones that are in the actual um, uh, marketplace at the moment, then obviously you can consider that. But basically remember that is basically you're looking at the, the genre itself and making sure that you, you meet the right aims for what you want for your game, what you've discussed in the title page. Uh, it says where you uh, write down your aims in terms of games, what will it be? Will it be um, a game where it could be like Assassin's Creed where you're going through and you're playing through a map and stuff like that? It could be a lot of the other games. It could be just a shooter game like uh, Call of Duty. It could be a 2D slider platform game like Mario. Do you know what I mean? And one of the things what genres that are coming out now more prominent in the next, <clears throat> excuse me, in the next few years is going to be virtual reality. So there's going to be a lot more games linked to virtual reality, okay? So Oculus has just brought out a new system um, and they can actually do a lot more what we call virtual reality games. I, I can only see that growing massively over the next 10 years easily. I think a lot of the other games are gonna fall to the wayside and you'll get a lot more virtual reality games. And that'll come to the part when we're doing logic design and a bit how we interact with the actual uh, tools that we use to play the game. So normally you're used to using a controller Whereas if you're using virtual reality, you have two hand controls, you have a headset, and it's slightly different on how we play games, okay? Then we need to think about the mechanics of the game. So mechanics of the game are the aspects, how the visuals are going to sound, the animations, the physics, and more. And I will show you later on, we're going to use a little program called Flow Lab, and it gives you a good under, uh, understanding how physics work in games. OK, and the animation and sound. But what you need to do is you need to sit down and make a plan of what the mechanics of the game are going to be. OK, um, and this can be quite a, a drawn out procedure, this one, because once you start doing all the design, you've done you've done the, uh, the title page, you've, you've identified um, the, the genre, you then come into the mechanics. And this is where you would probably bring in um, someone of a programming aspect into the team to discuss how the mechanics of the game are going to work and how we're going to deliver these mechanics, uh, what kind of programs uh, we're going to use, what kind of software we're going to use, what language we're going to use, programming language. And that's usually when the what we call the um, programmers come in and start putting their 10 pence in. Okay. Every game should have a story. Okay. It should have something, a start, a middle, and an end. Okay. So, if you think about the story, you need to think of like how how it's going to the play the game's going to play out from the beginning to the end. Um, so you need to think of things like uh, descriptions of the story, settings, and who the character will character will eventually eventually be. So uh, let's say back to the, back to Grand Theft Auto Five, the story revolves around three characters: Michael, Franklin, and Trevor. The story is what is that Michael is a former bank robber gone into the witness protection program. Trevor is old partner soon discovers Michael is still alive and they get back into heisting. So basically there's a story there, okay? It's not just a simple, just start the game and end. What will your story be? Will, will it have multiple characters in it or just one? Um, you could do a, what's called a hero journey where you start from the beginning, you've got to get all the way to the end. Uh, and you could have other people interact as you go along into the actual story. Uh, Non-playing characters, these are usually called NPCs. Uh, in, in like these characters all have distinct personalities. So in Grand Theft Auto, if you go up to certain people, the non-playing characters, they might have some kind of information for you. It could also be in other games as well. So you, if you go in Mario, if you go play Super Mario, you go up to uh, the characters in Super Mario and they give you information about how to complete the game. So they're sort of like guiding you along the story to make sure that you get to the end of the game, okay? And this is basically how you start setting out the game will be. So you probably realised up to this point what I've been talking is, we've not actually done any coding yet, okay? We've not even sat down and coded. We've discussed about coding. We've discussed about everything else. And this is what we call the game design development section, okay? It is really, really important when you're thinking about designing a game. Without doing this, you will fail as a, a as a game itself because you will you'll 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 find in, that when you get to programming the game, there's concepts in the game that obviously have not been discussed properly. And the programmer it'll be it'll be constantly going back to the team and saying, well, 
you've asked me to program this. However, this is not as easy to program as easy as you're saying. So then you'll have to feed back and the program will feed back to the team and say, I know you want this to do this, but we're going to struggle with that. So maybe need to look at the story again and change it a little bit, tweak it. And then what we'll do is you'll always do a project status report. And this is a regular progress report. So as you are developing the game, uh, you will go back. And like I say, it, the, the, the use terminologies like agile development, where basically is you keep do iterative creations of the game. And then what you do is you go back to the design board and think again, if something didn't work, go back to the programmer, uh, go back to the story. So it's constant evolving the project status report. OK, and you can add milestones for your team to complete. Uh, you can do that, say, say, like, say, the first month, you're going to get the game design documentation out of the way. However, that does not mean that the game design documentation is completed, okay? It's what we call a, a working document. It will carry on being a working document until the end of the game, okay? Uh, you'll get feedback from your team always, and they will tell you what's working well, what's not working well. You usually get quite a lot of feedback from a programmer if, they, if they're struggling to actually write the code to meet the requirements of the game as well. Okay. So I'm just going to come out of this for one second. Stop sharing that. No, I don't. I just want to stop the uh, presentation. Okay. Okay, so I want to go back to this. Uh, I'm going to show you a game that I created um, quite a while ago, believe it or not. It was 2015. Let me just open my document. I will share my screen again in a minute. One second. Oh, it's still sharing. Okay, so can everybody see this screen? Yeah? Yeah. Okay, yeah, brilliant. Okay, so basically what this software is, it's called uh, Visual Studio. Um, I don't know if anybody's ever used Visual Studio before uh, to actually um, program, but it's something that I used to use in college. Believe it or not, this game's now 20 years old when I was creating this game. But I wanted to show you how logic sort of like works in games and an example of seeing it. Okay, and we're going to go do a little bit more about logic in a bit as well. However, this is, anybody remember Simple Simon? Simple Simon game? Yeah, Simon yeah. Yeah. And so basically what you do is you follow the colors. So it gives you, it gives you a, a logic of colors and you have to follow them. So we have to use as human beings, we have to use our logic as well to remember it. So if I just run it, one second. There is sound on the game, but uh, it might not show up on, on the actual call, but the actual um, visuals will show. Okay, so let's just put me pseudonym in, which is Bob. Okay, now what I did, I created um, different levels of to play the game. So easy, medium, hard, and insane. Always start off with insane. Okay, and you start the game. So if you remember this game, how it used to work, you're following a, what's called a logical pattern. And you will keep following that pattern uh, all the way through till you get it wrong. Okay. It does get faster. It goes crazy, crazy fast. But I forgot it already. I'll do one wrong now to show you. So it's saying, oh no, I got it wrong. Okay. And then it goes to a leaderboard. So the logic, how, how we do logic in a game is what we do is we, we're setting up at the top everything we want to be in the actual game. But then when we come down, we're doing things like if statements. So we're going to do some kind of logic in the game. So if, if certain things are not running, then it can't do a certain part in the game. So that one's this text box name has got nothing in it. Then please type in your name. There would have been a message box popped up and then text name focus again. So 
logically, I have to write all this code logically to go down so that it runs in the right order to play the game, okay? Uh, and if it wasn't in the right order, so if we had the wrong if statement in the wrong place, the game is not going to run, okay? So it has to follow a logic pattern within the game, okay? Let me just come out of that, go back to sharing, okay? Come current slide, okay? So we're back on here. So let's do this now. I've added these links to show you how we do logic in games and game design. Let's see if it works. Okay, let me just pop that over there. Can everybody see that flow chart? Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. Okay. So this is a this is the documentation I created for that game when I was doing that game. Okay. And this is what we call, let me just make it a little bit smaller. Okay. Oh, that small pot. Okay, so this is what we call a flow chart. So as you can see, it follows a logical pattern when, when it goes down. So flow charts are a good indicator to show how the logic works in the game. Okay, and we've got a thing called structure diagrams, which I'm going to show you in a, in a minute as well. So as you can see from this flow chart, the game starts, you enter a name, okay, you select the speed, you click start, the computer displays a sequence of colors. User enters the same sequence of color, and then is a question, an if statement saying, if the user sequence is equal to the computer sequence, uh, no, go to the database and it would put out the, uh, the message that no, you failed. It puts it into the database and into the leaderboard. But if you've got the score right, if you've got the right one, it adds one, excuse me, one to the score. And then the one that makes it even more insane, it adds in computer increase the speed of the sequence. So can you see how that, that logically works from top to bottom for a flow chart? So you start at the top and then you go down to the bottom itself, okay? So this is, this is how logic in games is worked out. Without having to understand uh, the, the logic, you won't have be able to do the game properly, okay? Let me just click the second one. Okay, and then we've got a thing called, what's called a structure diagram. So in structure diagrams, we're again looking at how the game flows, the flow of the game, okay? And all this documentation is done before you get to any programming whatsoever. And what you basically do is you're doing what's called a sequence. So this is a sequence. And we're basically, what we're doing is at the bottom here, we're putting information in so that it, this is for the error for if you don't put the name in, if there's no name entered, display error message, else, numbers entered, display error message, so they put in the uh, numbers in the name, it will give an error message as well. And then last one, speed selected, if they didn't select the speed, it would give an error message as well. And then finally, it would actually play the sequence, but it goes through a logical order to actually get down to the bottom to there, to act, and that's just one step of what we call the um, structure diagrams for this game. We've got the play sequence. Okay, so the play sequence is, Underneath, when we've got there, play sequence. So user inputs a sequence, the computer checks the sequence, and if the user sequence is equal to the computer sequence, so like if I did the same pattern as the computer had already displayed, it would add one to the sequence, it's going to increase the speed, and then it's going to play the sequence again. If I didn't match it, it saves name and score to the database, okay? So if I failed, then it would go over to here. But again, there's a logical reasoning behind how we do everything in the game, okay? And then the last one is basically just the output to ski, uh, leaderboard. So you can say output to leaderboard, retry, retry button clicked, okay, input a name again, else end the game. So can you see how the, the structure of the game is actually created before you uh, actually um, do any coding? It's very important to get all these basics right before you actually do any coding. So that's something that um, all the game designers will have to do. It's not just quickly jump straight into the code or jump into a gaming engine and start building it in a game engine like Unity or any of the other ones that are out there. Um, it's basically you've got to sit down and work out the logic of the game and how it's going to work first, okay? So, next one. Okay, so... We're going to start looking at a thing called logic gates now. And logic gates are basically what we use 
to determine the logic of hardware and it can also be used to sort of like determine the logic of how a game is going to be played as well. So um, anybody used logic gates before? Yeah. Okay, so logic gates, they're basically uh, gates that we use to actually uh, determine the outcomes for different inputs. So we've got an input A and an input B, and then we've got an output Y, okay? And what we do is, if that is A is on and B is on, because this is an AND logic, so this symbol is an AND, if A and B are on, Y is going to be on. So you look at the bottom of the truth table there, you've got A, that's on, B, that's on, so the output is on, okay, true. Now, obviously, if you look down on the truth table, one, a is on, but uh, the bottom one's not on, so it's false because it's called an AND logic gate. So A and B have to be on at the same time for it to do an output as well, okay? And as you can see further on, false and true, it calls false. And then the last one, if they're both not on, it's not going to be output to C. So if you think about this in a game, how would this uh, allow button combinations of Mortal Kombat? So... If anybody has ever played Mortal Kombat before or Street Fighter or anything like that, you should know this. what's called the button combination. So when you click a certain button combination, then it activates certain uh, uh, different like special power or something like that. So if you're thinking about the logic of a game, having this kind of where you've got an AND statement in your actual game means that is if you press the up, but, up, up um, button and the fire button at the same time, you are going to get a different outcome compared to if you just press the up button, okay? So we use logic gates in, in, in game design and in hardware design quite a lot as well, okay? And then we have another one, which is called R gate, okay? Um, and basically the R gate functions whether there's either, it is either a, a inputs are true, both inputs are true, and output will also be true, okay? So if both inputs are false, the output will be false. And if you look at the truth table underneath again, so what we're doing now, we're saying if A or B are actually switched on, the output will be Y, okay? Will output be on? So as you can see in the truth table underneath, one and one is out, out output to C, which is true, it's on. Second one, A and B, well, we've got one on, so that's all that matters, it's coming out true. Same again, we've got one on just to flip the back way around. So it would have been B would be on and A would be off. Then it's output true. However, if none of them are on, the output is false, okay? Because at least one of them has got to be on, okay? Uh, and let's say, think how this will be used in the game to comb combine damage to a character touching items. So basically what you can look at and say is how, how this will be used. Uh, so let's just say if, you, if a character walks up to an item and they touch the item, let's just say in Mario, where you're collecting um, a star or a coin. So if, they, if it walks up and they're both true, or one of the items is true, then it will output, yes, pick it up, okay? Um, it could also be used with other gates as well to do multiple things. So obviously, you've got the AND gate, you can apply it with an OR gate as well. And this is how we build up the hardware section of how hardware interacts with the game, okay? And then the, the last one, which usually confuses most people, but is probably the easiest one in logic gates, is called a not gate. And the not gate is basically just an inverse. So it's going to invert whatever you put in. So basically, if you put something in here, uh, true, then it will come out false. And as you can see, it's a simple truth table at the bottom. Input, true. Output, false. Input, false. Output, true. So it reverses the logic. It changes it around, okay? Um, this Think how this will be used in a game. Activate doors open when character is close to the door. So as a character walks up to a door, it, it might say characters walking to the door, input true, and then obviously it'll open the door. But then when they're not there, it will close the door, okay? So when the character is close to the door, it could be used in all other things in a game as well. And like I said, we use these in a combination to actually meet the requirements of the game. Okay, and then in programming language, <clears throat> with the not gates, we also have these what's called comparison operators. So in a game, so 
these are what we use in the programming language. You've probably seen these before if you've used any programming language, Python uh, or any other ones, Java and other languages that are out there. Um, so the symbol operator where it's two equal signs is equal to. So basically, again, this can be, if you think about game design, when you hit the top score, say 10 out of 10, it'll return true and then it'll put a message onto the screen saying, oh, well done, you have completed the game, okay? Uh, however, if it's not equal to it, then it'll just keep returning false and you're still having to keep playing the game. But as you can see, 42 is equal to 42. However, 17 is not equal to 71, so that's why it returns false. If you think about that truth table from before, this is a similar thing to that, is if you don't get the right um, calculation, then obviously it will return false. And yes, it's probably a bit hard to understand this concept at the moment for a lot of people that are coming into the industry and stuff like that, but these are what we call the basic building blocks that you need to understand so that you can then design a game, because obviously if you can understand programming a little bit, it makes it a lot easier to design a game in, in, in the future. Then we've got one not equal to, so remember the not um, statement we had before, the little not icon, go back one, that one there, okay? It's not equal to, so it's an apostrophe and an equal sign, and it says not equal to, so we know, seven, is 17 not equal to 71? Well, it's not, so it returns true, okay? That could be used again. Uh, when you go in, let's just say you've collected loads of coins, and you want to go in and you want to spend the coins in a shop. And then what happens is you come into the shop and you want to buy a new armor. And it basically the armor costs 100 coins, but you've only got 35 coins. What you're basically doing there, it'll, you'll go up to it, you'll try to buy it, and it'll say, no, sorry, you don't have enough coins. So we'll be using that in a programming construct to say it's not equal to what it should be to actually buy, buy the actual armor. And then we've got return false. 42, not equal to 42, okay? Don't forget, because it's a not statement, it flips it round, so it changes it so 42 is equal to 42. However, we flipped it, so that's why it's returning false, okay? So if it was without that apostrophe, that would be a true statement because 42 is equal to 42, but because we've got the not statement, which we're flipping it, from thing it, it outputs false, okay? Then we've got other constructs, which are a lot easier to understand, Less than is basically uh, 17 less than 42. We know that because 17 is lower than 42, so it returns true. However, if you did 71 lower than 42, no, it's not. 71 is higher, and obviously then it returns false. The same with greater than. Is 71 greater than 42? Yes, so it returns true. Uh, is um, 17 more than 42? No, it returns false. Okay. So, and then we've got the last two, which are called less than or equal to. And basically that means is 42 less than or equal to 17, okay? Well, it's, um, it's 42 more than or equal to 42, yeah. So it, it's coming out tr true, less than or equal to, okay. Uh, that 17, sorry, 17 is less than or equal to 42. I was looking backwards then. So 17 less than or equal to 42, that's true because we're using that symbol there. That one is not used, but we're saying less than, so that means 17 is less than 42. 43 less than or equal to 42. Okay, that's false because obviously 43 is not less than 42 and it's not equal to 42 as well. And the final one, it's greater than 42. Is it more than or equal to 42? Well, it's not more than 42 because it's the same one, but we've got an equal sign in there, so it's classed as being true. Okay, and then returns false. 17 is more than or equal to 42. Well, it's not more than 42 and it's not equal to 42. So it returns false. Okay. Did everybody um, understand that principle there? I'm just going to stop and share my screen and see if everybody's understanding that yet. Okay. Yeah. So it, it, and this is, this is what we call the basic building blocks of how we look at programming, not just games, but all software. All hardware that you use, we use this basic terminology in, in everything. And this has been used for many decades, okay? It's not, not changed. It's been used since a long, long time ago, early 1940s, probably earlier than that in a different mathematical formation. But it's basically the, the standards that we use, okay? Right, I'm just going to share my screen again. Yeah. 
Okay. So, so examples, uh, what we call the equal example uh, operator is, let me just check the time. Yeah, okay. So like we say, 100 is equal to 100, that uh, output's true. 100 is equal to 99, no. So it put output's false. 99 is equal to 99 is true, because it's two the same. But we can also use things like strings to represent text case sensitive as well. So hello is equal to equal to hello is true because they're both exactly the same. However, hello is not equal to goodbye because it's false because hello is not an A, it's goodbye. And one thing you need to sometimes uh, be careful of in programming languages in, in strings, if you're using it as a string, save it as a string, is make sure that it matches the case sensitive because you can see that one's lowercase and that one's uh, uppercase. So even though they, they, they're both saying the same thing, it outputs false because that's seeing that as an uppercase and it doesn't match this one here, okay? Using Booleans, which is true or false. True is equal to true, true. False is equal to false is true. True is not equal to false, uh, is equal to false, but it's not because it, it's, it's the wrong way around. It's it, true and false don't match. So it outputs false. So that's the equal to operator examples. And then you've got the not equal to operators examples. So as you can see this time, because we've got the not symbol, we're actually outputting false, even though we've got the equal symbol because 100 and 100 is equal to each other, but it's flipped again. Remember the not one way it flips it round and outputs false. Then you've got 100 is not equal to 99. Well, that's actually true this time because it's saying 100 is equal to 99, but then you're flipping it uh, and then it's not, so it outputs to true. And then 99 is not equal to 99, false. Okay, and as you can see below, oops, sorry. Um, hello, then is not equal to hello, is false, because it is true actually, but because we've got that symbol, it flips it around. Hello equal to goodbye is okay, is, uh, is true, because it wasn't, it was false at the beginning. And the same again, false for that one, but it's flipped because it's true, okay? Uh, Booleans, true, true is false. False and false is false. And then the last one where before it was false, because we've got that not symbol there, is we're actually flipping it. So where it came out false before, it's now flipped it back to true, okay? Okay, so let's think of time. Okay, so we got less than or equal to, and as you can see, if 100 is less than 100, Okay, it's false because they're both the same number. 100 less than 99 is false because you can't have 100 below 99. 99 less than 100 is true. And the same applies for um, greater than as well, okay? Okay, and then the less than or equal to examples, quickly go through these. So 100 is less than or equal to 100. It comes true because you've got the equal sign in there. 100 is less than or equal to 99, nope. Neither of them work because it's false because 100 is not less than 99 and it's not equal to. And then 99 is less than or equal to 100. Well, it's not equal to, but it's less than, so it outputs true. And the same for the more than as well. Okay. Okay. So we've got the and statement. Now, this is something where what I'm going to do, I'm going to quickly show you this and then I want you to actually go on to something. I'm going to show you the example of it on the internet. And this is where you'll be able to click on them links. Okay, so basically we're using a thing called this um, logic gate simulator on the internet and you basically will set up how you would actually do it. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to stop sharing so I can stop this one second and get back to my website. Okay. And then if you go to the website, one second, let me share it again. Okay, so in the website link that I sent you, you just one there, the top one, it says Logic Gate Simulator. So if you click on that Logic Gate, it should open up to this website. Now what this is, it's a simulator of how you can build up gates and then you can test them. It's free to use, so feel free to use it anytime afterwards, okay? And what we're basically doing is, where you've got a selection of the ones that you can input there, so I'm going to just add another input, okay? And I'm going to add an and. And you remember that symbol from before? So basically what you do is you connect them 
the inputs, which would be A and B, and then the output, straighten it up. Okay. Now, if I switch one of them on, there's no output there, is there? Okay. Uh, but if I switch the other one on, it lights up straight away. So that is an example of what we call an AND gate. Okay. I'm just going to delete that. I'm going to put an uh, OR gate. And as you can see, the symbols are very similar, but they're obviously slightly different. So just be careful when you're putting them in. Okay, let me just switch them both off first. How do you need to straighten the lines? You don't need to straighten the lines, but I've got OCD and I like my lines to be straight. So, <laughs> um, and if, this time then, if you want to switch this on, and don't forget it's an OR statement. So, Either one of these can be switched on. And if I switch them both on, they're both on. But if I switch that one off, it's still going to be lit because one of them is on. Okay. So this is something that you need to think when, you, when you're when you when doing it. And this is a good tool to use when you're thinking about the logic, logic of the game, how it's going to actually happen in the game itself. I'll just do the last final one, which is a knot. Okay, and we don't need two inputs for this one. It's only one, as you remember, to the output. So if I switch at the moment, it's on. You can see it's on because it's off here. But if I switch here, it switches it off. So this is a really good little uh, simulator that you can use to actually um, practice how to do logic gates. Okay, feel free to do that in your own time later on. Um, the website's going to be live for a long time yet. Okay. Let me just go back to the presentation. I'm just going to stop sharing the screen. Okay, so how, how's everybody doing so far? Do you get an understanding the principles what I'm explaining? Yeah, if you want to give me a thumbs up, a reaction. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Okay. So yeah, like I say, it, a lot of people come into game design and they think, oh right. Well, I need to know programming straight away. There's a lot more goes on before you even get to the, 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 the level of programming, okay? And if you get the first bit right, the game will be correct, okay? And you'll have less chance of going back and having it again. So there's a game came out, Cyberpunk, uh, a couple of years ago now. Uh, it's, it's been racked with so many problems and stuff because they didn't fix it properly and stuff like that. I would have probably thought they'd have to go back to the, the design board and start again on certain aspects of the actual game itself. But it was a bit, bit of a bit of a flop when it was released because everybody was complaining there were so many glitches in the game itself. So yeah, it's really important that you follow the, the, the protocols to actually do it correctly. Okay, let me go back to me. One second. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to do, I'm going to get you to do a little bit of a, um, a test of what you've learned up to now. Okay, so if you go to the website that I've provided here, you'll see there's a logic and games design quiz. Okay, I'm just going to share my screen just to show you briefly. And I'll come out of it. So you can see this link here, logic and games design quiz. Okay, and you will get this student login. If you give me one second, I'm going to set the quiz up. Let me just stop sharing. Okay. Quiz. Let's start it. Okay. Instant feedback. Shuffle questions. Make it harder. Okay. Start. Don't you just love Google when you've not been on something for a long time? It then kicks you out. Okay. Let's try that again. Okay. So it's now started. And what you will be putting in is Bolton 4021. So let me share my screen so you can see the code. Okay. Bolton 4021. And put your name in. Okay. And then obviously attempt the quiz. So Jack's in already. Well done, Jack. Thank you. Dean's in. Yeah, I'm going to stop sharing in a minute when everybody's in because I don't want to, I'll stop it now because I don't want people to see what other people are scoring. Okay. 
So go through this quiz, see if you can get any of them, any of them right. It, all, everything that you've gone through this morning with me is in this quiz. Okay. So hopefully you've been listening intently, um, and then you'll be able to answer these questions. Okay. Come on, there's a few people not signed into the quiz yet. If you've got any problems signing in, just give us a shout. I have a problem signing in. Okay, so have you actually clicked the, the, the actual link? Let me just go to chat. Um, I'll put the link in again. One second. Just got to come out with that. Okay, I'll put the link in the chat as well. So maybe you can click that link and then all you need to do is put the room number in and I'll just put the room number in again. Room code. So I'll put it into the chat. There's a link and the actual room code as well. So you can try using that. And you just need to open it up in your browser. It should automatically open it up. Okay, we're getting quite a lot of good answers here at the moment. And only, a, only a few little mis mistakes. I misclicked one. Me too, Jack? Jack. Me too, yeah. Jack. <laughs> <laughs> I think I misclicked too. That's <laughs> fine. Do you know what? Do you what do you, uh, did, did I say there was a timer on this quiz? No, I didn't. So what you should be doing, you should be reading the questions carefully. As I, as I always say to all my students, read the question carefully before you click the answer, because sometimes this is where you, uh, people go wrong. They don't read the question properly. Doing really well. A lot of people doing really, really well. Yeah, we're getting a few more on now. Okay, while we're waiting for everybody to finish the quiz, you can open that logic gate in another tab and you can have a play around with that logic gate simulator while we're just waiting for a minute because I know some people have already completed it. There's just a few people that are just starting, probably getting used to, got, got the link in and started doing it, but really, really good results. You did well, Dean, you only got two wrong. It's because yeah. I, I was listening as well. Those two were just just wrong clicks, but I knew that. Mm. Well, yeah, to be honest, really, really good uh, feedback. That. It's really good. A lot, a lot of people there. So that, that to me, makes me feel like, obviously, you, you, everybody's been listening this morning, so really good. Thank you for that. Okay. I'll leave that running in the background because um, I am aware of the time and I want to get through some other stuff as well before we finish today. Okay. So... Yeah, thank you for that. It's a really good uh, thing. I've, I used Socrative years ago and, and I was like, wanting to give it a try again and see how it works today. And it is a really good tool to actually use to, to gain quick feedback off students. Okay. So, yeah, everybody's done really well. I'm not going to show the screen because I don't want to embarrass anybody if you've got any of the questions wrong. I wouldn't do that. Okay. Uh, so I'm just going to move that away. Click onto a different tab. Okay. And let's go back. So don't panic if you've not completed it. Oh, you can carry on doing it in the background. I'm just trying to get my presentation back up again. Okay.
Let's scan my screen. Okay, so I'm just going to open up. Let's see. Let's go and use a guide. Okay, so I'm going to show you in a minute um, a, a, a game uh, builder, and it's called Flow Lab. So I'm not sure if anybody's uh, has, has used this before, um, but basically it's a way of building up games using logic. Okay, and I, before I actually went into the game, I just wanted to excuse me, show you um, that in, even in this, this actual game the development uh, environment, we're using logic, you can use logic in here. So you've got logic gates in here again, AND gates, OR gates, or NAND gates, and we've got other ones called NOR gate, XOR gate, uh, and NOR gate and AND NOR gate are active when neither inputs are active. Uh, OX, XOR gate is active when one, when one single input is active. And then you've got X nor gate, which is actually when both inputs are on or off. We use it, we use these in a combination. So when we're designing a game, we don't just use one, we use we use um in a combination to actually meet the requirements of the game. Do you know what I mean? So and I'm just gonna pop back to the actual logic gate simulator and let me just get one on an example. Oh actually I'll show you an example for me. One second. Do, 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 do. It's in the other course. Chips. J A two. And that's all. One second. Uh, Check all written in. Okay, right. So I wanted to just show you how logic gates can be using uh, together. So as I showed you before, I showed like A and B. You got an AND gate, and it comes out like that. However, if we go a bit further down, you can start to see that you can add more of these gates together to achieve what you want to do in the game. So you've got basically A and B, which is then talking to an R gate, and then the outcome of the R gate goes into a, a O, okay? And then you've got C, which can be another import, and then as an AND gate. So whatever the output of the R gate, is then combined with the AND gate to give the outputs to the Y gate, okay? So it's not just, we wouldn't just be using just this, this, and these ones for, for building the logic of the game. We can build the logic of the game by combining the gates themselves. And as you can see, you can get really complex um, logic worked out from actually combining the games. And as you can see, you can see as the truth tables are getting bigger and bigger, um, these are using combined logic gates as well. So it's not just using just a single logic gate to actually build up. And this is how we build up um, combinations of uh, logic to build the actual game itself, okay? So let me go back there. So like I say, we've got all these logic gates inside this game that I'm gonna show you. You've also got things called like numbers and stuff like and expressions. So you can, the expressions in here we talked about before, you know, addition, subtraction, you can actually put them into the game division so you can divide things. So let's just say if you collected some uh, uh, in Mario, when you go big in Mario, sometimes you can actually turn around and say double the actual score of the collecting the stars. So you might have a bit of uh, um, mathematics in there to say when he is large, every star that he collects is double the points. Do you know what I mean? And there's all other things that you can do in there. So this is this is the, the sort of like the guide for using the software. What I'm going to do now is oh, I'm going to go into. The, yeah, can you yeah, please sorry. share this in the URL? Uh, the can you please yeah, yeah, share uh, the URL uh, in the chat? Yeah. Yeah, I've already shared the game itself. Let me just put this in. There you go. I'll put that in the chat. So this is behavior, yes. and what this is, it's it's um it's to help you work alongside this game. Okay. So Flow Labs. I'm going to go back to the beginning. Okay. So it's a visual game creator, and it's right in your browser. 
So you don't need to code with this, but it really does explain logic to you in games, okay? So yeah, we would still get the designer to code it. However, what you're starting to find now in game design is we have things called game engines. Has anyone heard of game engines? So basically these are software that have a lot of the programming code built into them already so that we just attach the actual elements in the game and the characters and stuff. However, if you were using one called Unity, that can actually work alongside Visual Studio as well. So this software that I'm using on here, Visual Studio, um, the company didn't have to pay for this. This is completely free to download. Okay, and I'll give you the link in the website. One second. So the link for the Visual Studio is there. So if you click on that, it takes you to Microsoft Visual Studio. Now, excuse me. There's two versions of it. There's a version that you can get for free and you can use as long as you want. Then if you've got a business that's running and you're going to be using it on multiple teams, then obviously you need to buy a business license. But as a rule of form, you can actually uh, use this software to uh, create things. And what they've added on, what's a real like recently, is you now can uh, design Android games inside Visual Studio as well. Okay, so if you're thinking of becoming an Android developer, it will actually build Android games as well, uh, cross cross platform ones. Um, and it's really, really good software to use. If you're getting into programming, I would say install this software uh, onto your system. When you're installing it though, it is can be quite um, thingy. You've got to follow the criteria directly where it is. There's loads of videos on how to install. It is done by Microsoft. So yes, it works really well on Microsoft systems. However, it's not work, it doesn't work on Mac, okay? Uh, and if it does, if you have ported it to Mac, you can do it through what's called Parallels Desktop or Boot Camp in Mac. So create yourself a Windows uh, operating system on the Mac and then install this. One thing I will say to you, it is very resource hungry. So if you was doing it on a Mac and you was using Parallels Desktop or Boot Camp, don't forget in a Mac, it uses it splits your memory between the Mac operating system and the Windows one. So you're going to only have less memory to actually run this on. So it's really, really difficult sometimes to run it on a Mac, but it works well on Windows. OK, um, once you downloaded this software, you can then use that to, uh, to program games. And one of them that works really well with it. OK, not managed to get it installed on me on my work one yet, but I've got it on my, on my own system. It's called Unity. So if anybody's heard of Unity before, I'm not on Paul's site. Hang a second. Did you share is that link as well, Paul, to uh, Visual Studio? Yeah, of course. It's, it's on the website, uh, Dean. You know the, oh, the, is it? Sorry. the link there. I'll put it in the link. So Unity will allow you to create games as well. You can can get you share your screen? Am I sharing it? No. No. Oh, right. Are you saying I'm sharing? One second. Try again. Apologies for that. I thought it was. Okay, so can everybody see that? Uh, yeah, I've just yeah. put the I've just put the link to Visual Studio in the uh, in the chat as well. Yeah, it's already on there. So if you on the website, if you go down, you've got a Visual Studio link there. Okay, so you can click that and that takes you to this website where you can download Visual Studio. Okay. I haven't put a link on for Unity yet on the web, but I will pop that in. Uh, can you pop that in the chat, Dean, for me, please, if it's okay? can't see the chat when I'm on sharing this side. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Um, I will put it on the website later as well, so you've got a link. Now, Unity works really well with Visual Studio, okay? So you can actually build in Unity and you can program it in um, Visual Studio. It actually works really well. Um, and you can get a unit, uh, you can get an account with Unity for free, okay? Um, I'm getting started, let's see if it's on there. So individual, student you can get a free account okay um and you can use it alongside visual studio which is free as well okay um so if you wanted to get into the coding side of gaming and you want to understand it i would certainly suggest visual studio 2022 and the unity engine as well okay um, that will give you access to 3d gaming creating 3d games and other stuff as well okay okay so i'm just going to pop back to flow labs so Flow Labs is like a visual game creator, so it's inside your browser, okay? And what it basically does is it, it creates connections within your game to actually um, connect each one. 
So I'm going to show you mine in a minute. It's free again to get started with. Um, you can go in and you can open up games that have already been created and look at other code. It's sort of like public domain so that everybody can see everybody else's games and stuff like that. And we sh it's a community where they share all the actual games and code and everything. Uh, I find it really helpful. So I'm just going to come back out of that one, one second. That's one award. Thank you. So I'm in, I'm in my game now. So I've signed into my game. And this is a typical game that you would do. So can anybody recognize the game? It looks very similar to Mario or what we call a two slider game. Yeah, 2D Mario. slider game. Okay. So as you can see, I've created a level. And yes, the building blocks are very similar. If anybody noticed it, a bit like Minecraft. So let's just say if I wanted to add something to the game, you add a, I could add another enemy, add to level, and I could put another enemy there, okay? And each one of these elements that are in here, specifically this one here, the character and the enemy, they've got code or logic behind them, okay? And basically what we do is we create the logic, so we create the actual interface of the game, okay? Put all the actual items on. Um, you can now you can add new items, but then obviously we need to do the logic that is involved in it. So I'm going to click my character and I'm going to click edit. And then what you do is you do things called behaviors. So okay, it looks quite complex, so please don't panic, but it is quite straightforward once you get used to it. Okay, so I'm going to start over here. So we've got a camera. Now a camera is going to be following me, okay, as I play the game. So when the, when the game is being played, as a character moves, the camera will move with it so that you get the, the, get the um, effect of it moving along the, 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 the actual level, okay? And then we've got logic for the keyboard. So we start in, we set the keyboard saying, oh, uh, left, and we're telling it to start walking animation. So we're doing a bit of animation to make it walk. We're doing the key right. And what we're doing is we're saying go backwards and go forwards, depending on which way we go. So left is backwards, right is forward. Okay. And we have to link this logic together and we're giving it a specific. So obviously if you're going left, it's going to be a minus one. If it's going to be uh, right, it's going to be a plus one six. Okay. Um, we've got a logic for the keyboard here. So when the keyboard is pressed, it jumps and it jumps with what's called the physics of 10. Okay. So we've got a current value of 10. You can change that whatever you want, but your character will go flying off the screen, okay? And then the other part of the logic in that keyboard one there is we have to set up an impulse, okay? So what impulse is, is basically, if I can hit the help there, and it's great, this little software, because what it does is it gives you all the information for each block that you put on. So impulse blocks add the physical force to the object immediately, instantly increasing the, uh, the object's velocity. So basically, X and Y uh, uh, equal to whatever it is. So basically it pushes it in whatever impulse that you said, okay? If you think about that in what we call logic is with every, for every time you press down the keyboard, we're basically saying that um, push that character one more forward uh, upwards and we're telling it to use an impulse what we've already set, okay? Then you've got things like collisions. So in a game, you'll have a thing called collisions. So we've got spikes in the game. You can just see them underneath, okay? Uh, and you've got uh, enemies, which are the little red characters. So what we need to say in logically in our game is we need to say when a character hits uh, a spike, then we're going to reduce its damage. OK, so again, that would be you know, the less uh, less than where when we click it spike. So we say if it's uh, less than less than three, which is a score, then the game ends. However, what we're doing here, we're just minusing the score by one. You start off with three and it minuses each one and it's linked to the health there. And then it's linked to the label that's up there. And then there's a filter less than one. So obviously that there, less than or equal thing, if it's less than, restart the game. So that's that, cat, that symbol where it's less than before that we was looking before. Okay. And then you've got collision for the sound and you have a sound effect. So you can play a sound effect as well. Uh, and then we've got the one for the star. So it's slightly different for the star. When the character touches a star, we're saying star plus, uh, it plays a sound effect, 
uh, and it keeps playing the sound effects once, okay? Uh, sorry, that's not part of that. That was just these two. And then we're saying to the label, it adds one to the la label score and it outputs a label. <laughs> so that one would be classed as a plus. <laughs> and I'd add one to the score itself. So quite simply, you can see the logic there that is built into that game, what we were looking at earlier on. So if I just literally go, I'm just going to go back up. <laughs> And I'm just going to put this over here. So as you can see there, uh, logic uh, equal to, so basically great less than um, three, we would be in our game, then still playing the game. However, if it's uh, more than or equal to three, then obviously the game restarts again. So then cat, them uh, logical operators are working behind the scenes in these to actually get the game to work. Okay. We've got one in here called spikes so basically in spikes what we're doing this time is <laughs> excuse me we're saying we want the character to when they hit a spike and, and they die we want a character to come back over here so what we're saying is we extract the value of uh, where the character is and we set the value of the character and when we put it back to the original place so when you start the game where the character is there is stored and then when there's a collision with spikes it resets a timer and it appears, well, what it does, it disappears first for a split second and then it reappears um, and then it shows back up over here. And I will demonstrate how that works now. OK. OK, so I'm going to go and get thing and play my game. Let's uh, give it a try. By the way, you can play this game because it's on the actual uh, website. Oh, I've already lost one life already. As you can see, I'm dead already. So I went back. So that was that that one where it said it calculated the coordinates. It said my coordinates were there. So as I was losing the game, it put me back. And as you can see, you can keep playing the game. And as I'm collecting the scar stars, the score is going up. Yes, you can cheat a little bit. I've uh, not worked the full mechanics out for the physics yet. But as you can see, it's quite an easy game to play. And it sort of like meets criteria for doing the logic. Oh, I don't want to die and get to the last bit. And that's basically how the game plays. It's a little uh, simple game. Now, I could say anybody can do this. Now, if you notice, when I was playing a game, I've only got this blue area here. However, when I play the game, it goes along. What you do is you just set that area that's called your viewport, okay, and the camera then follows you, so that background will go all the way along as well, okay? So it, the camera logically is following you, and the background will follow as well, okay? So that is basically how you can start to understand logic and game design. It's not um, what I would say proper game development because a proper game development will be classed as doing a programming. I'm just going to stop me sharing my screen for a minute. Okay, it's it, but it got sort of like gives you the under indication of how logic's work in game and how you can actually start understanding the principles behind it. So did everybody understand that and that demonstration of the game and the actual logic that I, I showed? Okay, so yeah. yeah. No. So it, that is it. So I'm going to leave the last 10 minutes for has anybody got any questions in regards to what I've done today? So is there any questions out there or anything you want to ask me about anything that we've gone through today? Do you want us to do the game? Create the game. You know what? I, I would say if you haven't signed up for this, uh, to, to be honest, the game will probably take you more than. 10 minutes to, to build. It will probably take you a little bit longer than that. What I would suggest though, is you create an account for uh, Flow Lab. Just sign up for Flow Labs, okay? You can sign up for free, okay? Just put your email thing in. Once you're signed in, obviously then you can actually uh, build the game and you, you get come in and you get the option. I'm gonna go back out online. How do I do that, please? You sign up for the game. The link is already on. I'll put the link on the website. One second, let me share my screen. 
So the link is on the website there, Flow Lab Game Creator. So you click that, and then obviously you sign up for free. Okay. I'll just give you an example of some of the other games. There's, there's quite a few games out there. Night of the Night of the Attack of the Giant Brown Marmorate Stink Bugs from Hell. What a name for a game. Okay. And it gives usually gives you the uh, the the what's the name, the keyboards to actually click. Okay. And I'm not going to play that because it's got flashing screens and I'm not aware of anybody's suffering from epilepsy today. So I don't want to put that actually on. But there's other games in there that you can go on and look at the uh, the what's the name, the forums. There you go, games. So you can see all the other games. And the good thing about it is, is you can click one of these games, okay? And it allows you to edit the game. So you can go in and you can edit the game and look, <laughs> excuse me, <laughs> what behaviors other people have put into the games. Now, that will help you when you are setting up and thinking about the logic of games because you can go and look at other people's games and see how they set it up, okay? And you can use that as examples. I'm just going to leave that one because I don't want to go into that. But yeah, and they've got forums that you can go into, you've got all forums for announcements and stuff, examples and tutorials, okay? There's loads and loads of help. I would definitely suggest if you get free time and you have to sign up for this and have a play around. Um, good thing about it as well, I'm just going to stop sharing one second, is if you do a paid account, which works out around about eight quid a month, you can actually submit your games to uh, uh, Google Play Store and App, App Store as well. So you could actually end up making money out of playing, uh, building these games. So yeah, it, it, it's, it's £8 a month. But if you think about it, if you put a game on, on uh, Google Play Store, like remember Flappy Birds when it came out? Everybody went crazy for it, and there's a, there's a, uh, everybody was like getting it. And all of a sudden, the guy who created Flappy Birds was a millionaire overnight, literally by creating this one game and putting it onto a, onto the system. Look at Wordle. I don't know if anybody plays Wordle. It's been in the press recently. The Times have bought it. Uh, it's not app based at the moment. However, you go to the website and you play it on a daily basis and do it. Uh, that has just exploded all over social media over this last week or two, all, all because everybody wants to get involved. So. I can see that becoming an app and becoming very popular in the future. Uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a program on the afternoons called Lingo, though, uh, that a guy uh, figured, and he's basically claiming copyright for the game because basically it's the same as Lingo, just a little bit different. Um, but yeah, so if you think about it, you can actually create a game and then all of a sudden you can have a, a big selling game on your hands. Um, and you could be, I'm not going to say I'm going to, I'm not like, there's a disclaimer here. I'm not going to say you're going to be a millionaire. You might only get like three or four people download your game and you might get £1.50 or something like that if you're charging for 50p. But most of the game revenue is done from advertising these days. And what they will do, they will actually allow you to submit this to Google Play Store. And if you add their advertising onto the game, they will pay you for the advertising as well. So you can actually just sit back and, um, claim from the advertising and put the game on for free so i mean i if like if you like me like everybody else everything i've showed you today is free to get so visual studio flow labs unity engine all these things they're all free to use okay now if you become a game developer then you would buy the professional packages because that's when you need the other tools and other information that you need in there however i'm a big believer of trying to get all free software to 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 demonstrate and show because it's nothing nothing worse than putting off a student and you say well if you want to use this software then you're going to have to pay this amount of money there's plenty of free options out there and things so like the, uh, photoshop for instance everybody goes to photoshop but you've got one called gimp which is graphic image manipulation uh, photography and that um you, you can use that and it's free so always have a good look around and see if there's any options but the th the ones i showed you today are completely free Okay, if you want to make money out of it, then you obviously you have to pay for it. But if you're just getting to use to logic, getting used to programming, <laughs> excuse me, then I would definitely uh, say download this software and have a play around with it. Okay, is there any more questions? I haven't got exactly how to log in, please. Okay, so what have you need to, to do when when you when you signed up for it, you will go. You will get a login email. It will go to your email, and then you need to uh, approve the email, and then it should come back. Um, 
let me just try a different one. So I've created so many accounts now. Um, can't think of another one I've got. I'll get back to work. I think I've got a back to work one. It is in the top right, Anne, of the Flow Lab website. I put the, the, yeah. the website in the chat. It says sign up for free. Yeah, and it's also on the website as well. It's also on yeah. that one there, the link right. there, sign up. And you click it, and what you do then is you just click sign up for free at the top there. And it'll bring you to this form. You have to fill your details in. And what, what you need to do, though, is you need to, when you've, when you've signed up, you need to go back to your email because it should be an email in there saying just confirm your account. Okay, because that, that that will mean and then you can start designing using Flow Labs. But it's, it is a lovely little tool. I love playing around with it. it, it I sort of like got involved in it a little bit more now. Um, I'm going to get my lads involved in it because obviously they like to uh, get, do a little bit of programming. And I think it's something that they will understand. And to be honest, to be fair, my lads know a lot more about gaming than I ever will because they play them constantly. And if I show them, how the games actually work it might give them a better understanding how to play the games better okay because obviously if you understand the logic of a game then obviously you can until so they have these gaming one of these things it's the next esports which is coming out which is basically people are actually now competing and having full events esports okay and if you think about it if you can get that logic in your head how the game works before you sit down and start playing a game, you have a better advantage of other people playing that game because you understand the logic of the game. So what to collect. And I mean, these, these guys, I watch them and the, the keyboards and the mouse are moving at hundred mile an hour. And they, they have, they are logically thinking on how to collect certain things for certain items and how to play the game in a quick way. So having that logical knowledge in your head of how the game works can be really beneficial for playing a game itself, as well as just designing them. So Hopefully that will help you if you're a gamer in the future. If you think of it next time you open your game, think of a, a logical way how things work in games. Uh, I'm terrible at Mario because I, I seem to go along, miss loads of the mushrooms, miss loads of the hearts. I get to the end and it says, you can't go to level two because you've not collected all these things. I'm like, I spent three hours playing this level and getting through it. And now it's telling me I can't move on to the next one. But that's because I didn't follow a logical path. And again, there is a logical path in the game that needs to be followed to meet the criteria to move on to another level. So that this is, and we we create this logic when we're actually designing the game. It's more on the design side, and then the programmer comes along and they actually then program it with the logic in it. Okay. Is there any other questions? I, I want to be sure whether I'm on the right one. Is it this video video studio uh, micro cross that I should use? Can you share your screen? Are you allowed to share the screen, Dean? No, well, I can put the. Uh... Sorry, my mic on mute. Um, I'd rather we didn't, but we can do it on a one to one basis. What we'll do is we'll, we'll get in touch after, Anne, if that's all right. And all right. We'll, we'll help you through it. Just to wrap up Paul's session, then, just really quickly. Um, so, what, what we're proposing is that you have a go. A game, yeah, um, and then this is this is for everybody. So have a go again and send it across to uh, either myself or Paul uh, a link uh, by next Saturday, and the winner will get a little prize. I'm not I'm not saying a weekend away in uh, in Barbados, but it'll certainly be a, a box of chocolates or something. And the other thing is, we'll do a write up of it. We'll get our marketing team to do a write up of it and, and post it on our socials as well. So that's that's ready for uh, for next week. I've popped Paul's email in the chat as well as mine. So if you do want to get involved, have something uh, ready for us. Closing date is next Saturday. So Saturday the 19th. Um, uh, and, and Paul and I will then have a, a little play of your games and we'll choose the, we'll choose the winner. So that's, um, that's just ready for next week. Okay, we've got that survey to complete. So if you go back to, I'm, a, I'm a still sharing. Can't remember nope. one second. Let me go back, uh, click. Okay, so we, we've got a, what we call a Logic and Game Design Masterclass survey. So if you go to the website, I'll put the link in the chat as well. I managed to copy it over, Dean, so it's actually uh, the one now. So you need to be uh, ticking B2W Masterclass, that one there. So when you click the link, you'll go select that one, and then you will fill in when did the course start today, which is the 12th of the second. Uh, when the course finished, 12th of the second. Who is your trainer? Obviously, I'm here, Paul Bolton. Okay. 
and then you will regrade what you part of the course, uh, what we've done today, and then submit. So I'm just going to stop sharing and put that into the chat. In case anybody can't see that. But it's also on the website as well. So if you want to fill that uh, survey out for us, please, as well. It uh, gives us a bit of an idea of how we've performed on on, the, on, that, on anything that we might be improved. I'm a big believer in feedback. I would rather have feedback than no feedback at all, because obviously it improves my teaching practice and how I deliver things. So, yeah, please, please fill that in so that we know. I'd, I'd have a, a question. Um, yes, sure. are, you guys, are you guys going to do anything like like a more progressive course of this, like a more detail, or you're going to have like opportunities to to learn more or some sort of that? We we are, we are open in the future, Dean, to do apprenticeships in software development, aren't we? So we are we are going to be doing uh, the software development apprenticeship. And that will involve programming, uh, how, to, how to go deep into the programming sections and stuff and learning. And it will be focused probably around something like a game. We'll, we'll try to make it so that it's fun. So, um, I mean, a lot of the software programming uh, elements will be combined within a game itself. So the logic, the things like your structure diagrams, your flow charts, um, everything that you need to build a game, but then actually you will be coding a game. Uh, as part of the uh, end project uh, of, of what we do, would do in that apprenticeship. So yeah, that that that's coming in the future, isn't it, Dean? So uh, keep keep looking at the website when it's available. We'll let you know. We can uh, always email you as well. Yeah, absolutely. Software development level three, we're we're hoping to have uh, in place uh, probably hopefully by the summer. Yeah. Can I, just, can I just add, Dean, um, hi everyone, Angela is on the call today, so if anyone is interested in, in doing any of those programmes, she's just dropped her uh, details in, in chat. Uh, we do also have a level one creative skills course on our pre-apprenticeship programmes as well, so if anyone wants any more information about that, please drop Angela a quick a quick call and she'll or a quick message and she will refer you over. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, well, listen, I'm going to stop. Oh, sorry, Dean, go on. I was going to say thanks for that, Paul. That was fabulous. Really, uh, really enjoyed that. I think it was really informative and um, I think I've learned more today about games design than I knew before. So thank you. I, I really appreciate thanks, that. Dean.